top five regrets of the dying. And um, she was a hospice nurse who worked with the dying people and talked to them. And, and uh, the number one regret that people had, people who were dying, who knew that they were crossing over and making their transition, the top regret of, was I wish I'd had the courage to live the life that I knew I was destined to live. In other words, that I had a purpose, that I knew that there was something greater that I came here to do, that I signed up for something other than just to fit in and to, to go along and to follow somebody else's rules. And most of us are not, uh, don't allow ourselves the freedom to listen to those internal callings, those things that we all feel are just so important to us. I can give you two examples of the most important, the two most significant moments in my life that I can think of, other than the birth of my children and all those wonderful things that took place. But the, that I was at my, I went to my father's grave in uh, 1974, uh, a man that I just hated. I was filled with rage and, and antipathy and anger towards, and I was called to go there uh, at the age of 34, uh, and I went there because I was just angry. I wanted to make a connection. I just couldn't believe that this man, he'd been dead for 10 years and I had just found out. And I stood on his grave for the longest time just cursing and being angry. And I went back to my car, it was, it was down in Biloxi, Mississippi. And I got into the rental car to drive back to New Orleans and to, then I was gonna fly back up to New York because I was a professor at St. John's University in New York City. I had been thinking about wanting to write and, and all of that, but I just nothing was going right for me at that time. I was out of shape, things weren't working well, I was drinking, I had been doing drugs, I was in a bad relationship. My whole life was just not on the kind of path that, that, I, that it is on today. And I got back in the car to go and I felt I'd finally done that and I had a calling. I was called back by some invisible intelligence, some burning desire, something that we call light, something that we call the, the impersonal part of us that is always directing us, and it's always directing you as well. You're listening to it sometimes. Most of the time we ignore it in the way of, in the name of fitting in or doing what I don't have time, or I'm too old, or I'm too fat, or I'm too skinny, or I'm too white, or I'm too black, or I'm too poor, or an endless we go with all of the reasons why we can't fulfill a destiny that we know is ours, that we signed up for, that we're here for in this infinite universe, that who we are is not this physical body that we're in that is here for a moment and gone. Who we are is this infinite intelligence, and we forget that. The same intelligence that, is, that created this infinite universe that never ends is you. You manifested in this infinite divine organizing intelligence. You're a part of all of it. And I got a calling, and the calling for somehow said, go back. You're not complete. That's not why you were sent here. That's not why I wanted you to go to your father's grave. I went back. Something came over me at the age of 34. I have no idea what it was. I do know now that it was light, it was God, it was that divine intelligence, whatever you call it. What I said at that gravesite, from this moment on, as I send you love, I send you kindness. I, who am I to judge you? Who am I to condemn you? Who am I to criti be critical of you? I don't even know what you were living through and why you had to do what you did. I send you love from now on. I'd never had another bad dream about him, I was never angry about him. But the most intriguing thing happened is that my life made an entire shift a shift that all of us can make at any moment. We never know these callings are so strong and yet, the, and they're always there. After I left Biloxi that I flew up to New York, flew down to Fort Lauderdale, I had two weeks. I checked into a motel on A1A, uh, the Spindrift Motel, uh, and I wrote for 14 days. And I wrote a book called Your Erroneous Sounds, which became one of the largest selling books in, in history. And it propelled my life in a whole new way. I stopped drinking, I started getting ex exercising more. My relationships all changed. The, the, the divine person that I was to meet showed up. My children showed up. Everything changed and shifted because I was willing to listen to that inner voice, that light that said, go back. Another time, just a few years later, uh, it was 1976, I was driving on the Long Island Expressway from where I lived in Huntington, New York, into, into the city. I was about to receive tenure which at that time I was 36 years old. I had written three textbooks. I was a star there as far as they were concerned. I was, to, I was gonna begin you know, to, uh, you know, to live a life in which I was gonna be a professor for the rest of my life. Tenure, guaranteed uh, employment for the rest of my life. Something that everybody at the university longs for. I was ready for it. And I pulled off the Long Island Expressway as I was t contemplating that. 
and I sat on the side of the shoulder there for about a half an hour, just watching the cars go by, wondering and asking myself, do I really want to get tenure and stay here and do what I've been doing? I've already done this. I know how to do it. Am I going to be in the same office doing the same thing? Am I going to live 90 years, you know, or am I going to live one year 90 times over and over again? And I decided that I just couldn't, couldn't do it. And I just felt, ah, oh, this amazing moment came over of freedom. It was like it just was lifted off to me. And I got back on the freeway, went to get off at the exit at Grand Central and Utopia Parkway, parked my car right outside Marillac Hall, went up to the second floor, went into the dean's office, Dean Sarah Fassenmeyer, and I told her, I've written this book, and it's now just been published, it's called Your Erroneous Owns, that I wrote also as a result of, uh, of another calling. And I said, I've got to take it out to the world, I've got to talk about it. Just, I, I appreciate the fact that I could work here for the rest of my life, but it's just not something that I can do. And she tried to get me to dissuade me from such a thing. These kinds of callings, we all, we all have these, we know that we have a purpose. You already know that you have a purpose. You know, you're listening to that all the time. It's there. The, the idea that you can't do it or that you shouldn't do it or that you my whole life has been impacted by listening and being willing to understand that. And there's a, uh, there's a quote that, uh, that I talk about at the seminar that'll be a part of this course that, uh, and it goes like this, it's from William Blake. He said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern, by William Blake. We would begin to see, I don't know if you've ever heard of a group called The Doors, by Jim Morrison and the rock group. They took the name from, the, uh, from, from that essay that uh, uh, Aldous Huxley wrote called The Doors of Perception. There are things that are known and there are things that are unknown and in between are the doors. And even Jesus said, I am the door. That is the internal I'm, I amness within God is the door that you can open and discover so many new things. And another one of the, of the uh, principles that, we, that I talk about is, uh, is this, that a lot of people have difficulty understanding. It says the laws of the material world do not apply in the presence of the God realized. I was on, a, on the Tonight Show in Australia uh, a few years back and the woman asked me the question, what is your purpose? What are you here for? What do you want to do? And I said, I'd like to understand God realization. I'd like to be able to understand and live from that place where God is within me and I know it. And in this course we've created four meditations. The importance of meditation, I can't stress it enough. You have to go to the silence. You have to go to the place within that can't be divided. Think about it. Silence is the only place where you can go that you can't divide it. You cut it up and you still got more silence and more silence. And it is in that silence, in that meditation. And I deliver some really very, very powerful meditations with some readings uh, that when you understand them, you'll understand that the laws of the material world do not apply in the presence of the God realized. Once you're in that state of God realization, you'll understand things like your intuition, that is that inner calling that says, go this way instead of that way. Try this. Don't be afraid of that. Get rid of the fears that are so dominating your life. As Anita talks about fear and, and what a thing it was that created the cancer in her life, which allowed her to, uh, to almost come to a place of dying. You'll discover things like synchronicity, that uh, you have a thought and all of a sudden what you place your attention on begins to manifest and, and, and arrive in your life, you'll discover that those thoughts are not just things that are just our happenstance. There's no happenstance in this entire universe. It's all held together by a divine light. And one of my favorite readings uh, I'd like to share with you uh, is from the life and teachings of the masters of the Far East. It said, it has been clearly stated that life lived by the average individual is hypnotic. That is, the majority of men and women are not living life as it was intended at all. Not one in a million feels the freedom to live what he inwardly feels he should live. He has come under the world's opinion of himself, and this opinion is what he obeys rather than the laws of his own being. In this respect, and to this degree, he is living under an hypnotic spell. It's like hypnosis. He lives under the delusion 
that he is a mere human being living in a merely material world and only hopes to escape it when he dies and goes to what he calls heaven. This is not the determination intended in the plan and purpose of life. Obedience to one's inner nature, the expression of life as he instinctively feels it ought to be expressed, is the very foundation of the life which the masters reveal as the only true mode of living. That is very powerful awareness that you are not this body that you're in, this body that comes and goes. You are the invisible divine intelligence within, the same intelligence that allows a clay pot to exist. And finally, from the Masters of the Far East, the second volume, the moment you become free from the belief that you are mere human beings, subject to human laws of life and death and the limitations which human beings have imposed, that moment you will see that you are free from all human limitations and may become sons of God, if you will. The moment you realize that you are divine, that you are free from all limitations and possessed of the strength of divinity, and you know that this divinity is the place where being comes most directly in contact with God, man is then beginning to see and know that this divinity is not something to be injected <clears throat> into each other from without, he is beginning to know that it is the very life of each and every person, your essence, the light within you. This is what this course is about. This is a course that we go deeply in depth in. And the reason that I put the course together in the first place is because I have heard no, nothing but positive, enlightening comments from people who say, it turned my life around. I finally went within and discovered that I am capable of using this divine intelligence that we call light inside of us to create the life that I was destined to live. I hear it over and over again every time we do it. We do it in an entire weekend seminars. Anita and I have done this entire seminar in Portland. We did it uh, in, uh, in, in Maui and we're doing it all over the world. But look, I would like to be able to go everywhere. I'd like to go to every country in the world. I'd like to go to every city in the world and present this. It's just not possible. That's the beauty of the internet. That's one of the things that we can do. We can put this course online and give you an opportunity to be, a, be in that seminar yourself. This is what we're offering. I hope you enjoy it. I'm sure that you will. I am light. <laughs>